very good sessions in palliative care. Uh, so I'd like to start my session at this moment. Uh, I'm just sharing the screen now. In between, I want to share one thing. And today, we have sessions on subcutaneous infusion. I think this is a uh, new knowledge for the participants for sub about this subcutaneous infusion. And today, we have a case presentation by Sister Preeti on the same topic. But unfortunately, Sister Preeti informed that she is busy with some duty. She can join the session. If he is not able to take the case presentation, then I will manage the case presentation. Then we can have to open this for an op open discussion. So you can start up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So it's nice to see you all here again after many days. So earlier, uh, I came forward with, to share uh, a topic on uh, ostomies. I hope uh, that gave you a lot of information. And today I'm bringing up another very important aspect or uh, uh, the root of uh, administering medications. To most of our palliative care patients who are in end of life, it's not a big deal to say that it is a, it's not a, even a one hour topic even. It's a very simple topic, but somewhere I, I can feel that you all can learn a lot from this session. So let's go forward to see what it is. I would like to start with one of our case history. Like we see a lot of patients with different problems and different issues happening there. So I hope this can give you a lot of information instead I going to the next slide. So a patient, a gentleman with um, a lady with uh, uh, diagnosis with the carcinoma of right breast with the infected wound and um, just a minute hmm. with the lung mess and her PPS is 20% experiencing severe pain in the chest, breathlessness and anxious. I repeat this word again. The patient is experiencing severe pain in the chest and she is breathless and anxious too, more worried about her condition. When you talk about her financial or family background, She's from a very poor family background and uh, resides in a remote area. Please note this point. She resides in a remote area. So belongs to the, the district or the place which is very far from uh, the available resources like the hospitals or whatever it is. How can we help this patient and family in their suffering? We are sure that in palliative care, when you come to know about what it is, we just don't deal with um, the patient himself, but also the family and their sufferings too. So how are we going to help this patient and the family? What health education can be provided? The question about the health education be provided would be new for us because a lot of our patients who are getting admitted in the hospital may just feel that, okay, till the time when the patient is admitted in the hospital, we may have to care them. Once they go home, they really don't have any kind of support or um, uh, any, any kind of support provided from any, any kind of a health education team. So what kind of health education could be provided to her at the situation and to the family and how to provide a good quality care? I'm talking about the good quality care again in palliative care. This is what our goal should be. So when you see such patients who are suffering a lot, what should be the protocol or the plans in implementing or uh, improving the patient's quality care? and the comfort during her end of life. <clears throat> I'm coming back to the first uh, uh, point which is mentioned here. A patient with the right breast cancer, an infected wound and lung metastasis with the performance of 20. What, is it, what does the performance of 20 means? It means that the patient is in the mm -hmm. last stages of their life. She's in a very bad stage. And not just that, she's also having a lot of pain over the chest region and also breathlessness and anxious. So this is what a brief information about her background. Uh, performance 20 is nothing but she is an end of life. Just remember that. We'll go in detail about what it is. What is a subcutaneous infusion? It is nothing but an alternative route to the intravenous or intramuscular. Or the subcutaneous injection is also called as a hyper uh, hypodermoclysis. A subcutaneous injection is administered as a bolus into the layer of the skin is directly below the dermis and epidermis. It has an effective, highly effective and suitable alternative in administering uh, medications. So this is an alternate route of that. When you talk about IV and intramuscular or intravenous, we all heard more about that. In every hospital setup you go, they talk more about that. Even we have seen most of the patients uh, uh, who are on, uh, prescribed on tremadol were given intramuscular more frequently. 
so which would be more painful and even the intravenous where the intravenous maybe sometimes it may get blocked or uh, sometimes uh, it may leak or get infected there are a lot of things and also it may remain for not for a long time maybe on on the third or the fourth day or the fifth day you may have to change the whole pattern of that so frequent pricking again it's also a kind of procedural pain how do really the subcutaneous route help this kind of patients in this situations we're going to see that uh, i have brought one picture for you it's a butterfly wing set needle which we use it regularly in an uh, in a fast upcoming situations where in instant manner that will be more helpful and more cheaper when compared to the iv cannula so we just have to poke it in so that the fluid or the medications which are administered through the iv but still some on the other side when you talk about this butterfly wing needle or the wing set it is more helpful in administering the subcutaneous medications even it can be fixed under the skin so that the, all the drugs which are given in palliative care can be given through that i'll just talk about that a bit later um so you have seen this slide and i'm going to skip to the other one now it's an iv cannula which is of the 26 gauge needle in that uh, i can call it as it is given for the pediatric patients most probably for the iv, IV access but sometimes even <clears throat> we prefer more using this kind of iv cannulas under the subcutaneous route even so this can be fixed just like an iv it can be fixed just under the skin as a port and uh, the plasters can be fixed over that i'm going to share the video also at the end of the session don't worry about that how to uh, do that i have a demo of that what uh, we have done before so this kind of cannulas also can be used when compared to this butterfly wing set and the iv cannula what you are seeing right now what would be most preferable when you talk about that but here somewhere in this wing set needle it's a needle it can't be stayed for a long time when compared to the other one but on the other side this cannula needle will be getting out so only the plastic metal material which is inserted into the subcutaneous root will stay back or remain in there you may have to fix it well secure well so that it will not get any damages or leakages from that side more comfortable it can be used for the long time so these are the two things what we have and also i would like to add uh, the drive fixer up to the iv tubing so we also have a syringe drive i'll talk more about that Uh, it is just to show you like how it uh, uh, it is presented in and uh, <clears throat> this is called as a subcutaneous syringe drive a continuous subcutaneous syringe drive the advantages and all i am going to talk about that this is more comfortable for patients who really are in need of a continuous medication in there are a lot of times more worried that more frequently the nurses going up pu uh, pushing the drugs in they come back if they are so busy they may just push those drugs just like that and they come back it is more painful for the patients to prevent that and also this continuous subcutaneous syringe drive is more helpful for patients <clears throat> who are in need of uh, continuous medications for a full day this medication can be used for 24 hours right at the time you start this and it can be the, the whole drug will be finished only after 24 hours you just have to measure the millimeters of this and the speed has to be calculated and fix it up to the um, subcutaneous port port is nothing but either the tubing what you have seen butterfly wing needle or the 26 gauge iv cannula because this 26 gauge iv cannula is very small and uh, the gauge is also very less so it is more easy for them convenient for the patient uh, to uh, to fix it up on the body uh, and also on the other side there are few drugs which have been added uh, in there so this is called as a syringe drive uh, started at 5:20 pm it was just mentioned by the nurses and Uh, labeled well on that we have different kind of drugs which are uh, mixed together you need not wait or you need not waste lot of syringes again and again pushing it wasting your time so to prevent that and also the drug will be in a continuous process the drug just just moves into the body in a in a given time so that there will be no fluctuating levels of that so on the other side when we talk about that the patient with the performance of 20 and having lot of pain 20 is nothing but this patient can't take any medications orally <clears throat> on the other side when the patients cannot take oral medications we may have to skip up to the other route maybe the iv very well done so okay when you talk about the iv route how good is it going to be when you think that this patient may live for a week or 10 days assume that so do you think the one iv cannula can helpful in their situations and if what happens if the patient may develop delirium or irritable or confused they may pull those iv cannulas off of the body 
So if such things happen, there will be loss of blood going out of the body then. So a lot of disturbances happening. To prevent that, the subcutaneous route is more comfortable and infusion, the, like, um, the subcutaneous syringe drive can be more um, easily available and you can just fix those uh, drugs together. So we have added some doses of morphine 30 mg uh, to this and also injection midazolam has also been added uh, like this 10 mg and haloperidol, we have added a little dose of haloperidol also to that uh, to prevent those kind of end of life you know, patients may develop delirium at that time. So these three drugs together are loaded into a, a 20 ml syringe and we have fixed it. What does it mean? So morphine, midazolam, and haloperidol are the compatible drugs. These are the three compatible drugs where these three drugs can be mixed together and administered together. So all the drugs can enter into the bloodstream directly. Only thing stopping me here is IV have a more access or fast acting when compared to the subcutaneous. Do you think it is a it is a one day process? Not at all. This patient may need a comfort care, like I told you before in my first slide, when we talk about the comfort care or the goal of uh, care to be provided is, it's all about the comfort care. When you talk about that, the subcutaneous route is more comfortable till the patient end of the last breath, the patient can be put on this till the time when the sufferings are being reduced. So when compared to the IV, you have an accessibility of uh, the subcutaneous route, which is more comfortable and more helpful at this time. So we can go for the syringe drive even. So what are the common sites of uh, to place this subcutaneous port? IV, we all know that wherever, wherever there is an access of uh, uh, the vein, you can just fix an IV cannula there. As the same, what are the common sites of to fix the subcutaneous port? Number one is the upper chest. Just below the clavicle is the site where it is more comfortable and it is open. So patients, if they wanted to see how the condition is, it's easy for them. And also for the nurses or the doctor who is on the duty today, also can see the condition of or placement of the subcutaneous port. Is it in the right place or did it move up to the other place? So that's what. And also look for the swelling and all. So I'll talk about that later. Number one is an upper chest. Number two is a shoulder below the deltoid. Most of our patients I see are more scared and worried about that. Frankly to say, except the people in the palliative care, none other people or the none other professionals know more about the subcutaneous route. They feel that when you have an access of IV, why do you want to go for that? When you talk about that, we have a lot of benefits going out to the subcutaneous route. I'm going to talk about that in the next few slides. So, but most of the patients and the families are more scared of putting a needle into uh, over the chest region. They feel that it may just penetrate or uh, you know, go deepen into the chest level. So sometimes maybe patients on, on preferably the patient's uh, request, we may just go for uh, uh, the deltoid site even. And also even on the abdomen, both sides of the lumbar site is more preferable and you have a lot of uh, thick uh, fatty layers there. It is more comfortable and easy for uh, you know, easy to fix up uh, uh, subcutaneous port there. And over the thigh region, do not put it on the anterior aspect of a thigh. Try to go for the lateral aspect of a thigh because anterior aspect, you have a lot of muscle there. So when you just directly introduce drugs into that, it may take a lot of time because it is not a subcutaneous part. So it, it would be called as an intramuscular again. So a lot of uh, patients experience pain just because of that. So try to go for the lateral aspect of a thigh. And last but not the least here, I'm talking about the scapula. So the patients who are in the conscious levels and uh, who can um, accept for the subcutaneous route, that is okay. I'm talking about the patient who is delirious and irritable and inappropriate behavior and very bad. You know, the delirium state is somewhere around six or more than that. I don't think so. These patients can put on an IV cannula. This is another advantage of that. IV cannula, it's easy for the patients to pull it off. Maybe at the midnight, the nurses will be taking rest at that time. The family will be sleeping. All of a sudden, the patient removes the cannula, IV cannula. There will be a lot of blood loss. So you can't manage that at that time. So to prevent that, a lot of our patients, what we try to tell them is, or the family members, is scapula is a site where uh, it can be just placed over the scapula bone, just like that. So it can be fixed directly perpendicular to that. So this remains just like that. So it will not hurt them. It will not injure their body even. So, and also patient can't pull out it, pull out the um, subcutaneous port which is kept. So these are the common sites uh, what we can uh, um, use the subcutaneous port for. So here the question is, why do we give subcutaneous injections? Like I discussed earlier, 
a bit of information about them. So it can be used to cure many type of medications. In the earlier slide, I have shown you already, morphine, merazolam, and haloperidol. Three drugs are compatible. So these three drugs can be mixed together and administered directly. So when compared to that, it is more comfortable and easier. So too many drugs together can be mixed and administered. Number two, the patients who cannot take oral medications and who are in the semi comatose state. First thing I could like to add up a point to that is, the same patient would be conscious a week ago. He used to take oral medications, like 10 mg of oral morphine, uh, well, very fourth early. And all of a sudden, his level of consciousness has come down and became bad. And uh, he's in a state where he could not take at least oral drops of fluids even. Can't expect any oral medications to be given for that patient. And he's in a semi comatose state. So do not stop administering medications, but still you have another option. Go for the IV if there is a possibility. And when you think about these kind of drugs which are to be given together, better go for the subcutaneous route because the morphine, midazolam and haloperidol are more effective in the IV route. When you administer medications like that, patients semi in the semi comatose state and also uh, they can't respond to you properly and the respiratory rate and it would be a shallow breathing maybe in the end of life you see. At that point of time, the drugs can cause more of a, uh, problematic to the patient. You know, suddenly the respiratory rate may come down all of a sudden. To prevent that, subcutaneous route is more safer when compared to the IV. I'm just trying to differentiate like which would be the best um, route of administering medications. So the third point is it helps to have a continuous flow of medications avoiding delay. When you go for the subcutaneous injections or the infusion, it will not have a breaks there. For example, if you put a same patient on morphine, uh, 5 mg every fourth early. Just assume that for next 24 hours, you just put 5 mg fourth early. Maybe the nurses will be busy at the time of administration, or maybe it's time at two o'clock, and the nurses have delayed in administering medications due to their busy schedule. Sometimes they skip up the medicines, or you know they make it more delayed. If that thing happen, surely the pain may come down. Sorry, the pain may increase again, or the irritability, or whatever it is, or the breathlessness. Even. Once it is high. You know, even the family or the patient's stability will not be under control. So all of a sudden, it may increase and it may take time for you again to spend a lot of time there in controlling those symptoms. To prevent that, the continuous flow of medications, uh, it is more helpful and it also avoids uh, uh, delay in administering medications. So there are drugs with the three compatibility uh, can be given, also can be given through this uh, route. Just a minute, please. One minute. Yeah, I'll go for the next slide. Okay, so one drug, I'll just mute my uh, video. I'll stop my video because I have a power cut here. Yeah. Okay, so one drugs can be given in this route then. Many of them would be bothering or uh, you know, surprised about, do you think really all the medications can be given through that? Not at all. The medicines which are given in palliative care, I'm talking about only the palliative care. And this patient is an end of life. Can't expect a lot of IV fluids. Can't expect a lot of um, antibiotics to be given in the end of life situations. Most probably we try to take out all the unwanted medications for him and or the patient and um, try to provide a good comfort for the patient at this point of time. So it would be more comfortable, easier. So what drugs can be given in this route then? So most of the drugs used in palliative care can be given. For example, uh, drugs like morphine, like we have seen before, it can be given subcutaneous and uh, midazolam uh, and few NSAIDs like uh, Kitrolac also can be given through that route. Paracetamol as an antipyretic and anti um, antipyretic um, and analgesic too. And um, drugs like uh, tramadol also can be given uh, very IV, uh, sorry, very slow in the same route. And also medications like uh, perinom, uh, zofer, ondansetron, and uh, ketamine. You know, there are such kind of drugs which are, can be given uh, in the subcutaneous route, maybe this time. And the second point is drugs in the powder form. Remember that point, drugs which are in the powder form are not recommended in this route. So for your information, uh, drugs in palliative care, when you just go through the drug formulary, we have a sixth or seventh edition of drug formulary. Mm. So just go through that in um, PCF, that is a palliative care formulary book. 
um, so in which it, it shows that what are the drugs can be mixed together and uh, which may have a crystals forming up into that when you mix those two and what are the alkaline drugs available what are the acidic drugs or the neutral drugs available so based on that we can just mix up two drug compatibility as well as a three drug compatibility so drugs in the powder form are not recommended in this route what what really happens when you administer the drugs which are in the powder form for example an antibiotic or the taxim or the pantoprazole so when you dilute it into the water for injection it's easy for you to administer in the iv route and compared to the subcutaneous when you push the drug directly the drug will not get absorbed into the blood stream and you can see a lot of uh, swelling over that particular site and tomorrow you can see a lot of extra vascularization happening there because the drug deposited just under the skin so it is not so recommended at that time so as i told you that it is preferable for palliative care uh, um, in in administering few medications like uh, um, symptom control or uh, controlling the vomitings or whatever it is so ph level of the drugs has to be checked before administering as i told you that palliative formulary gives you a lot of information there in that so what drugs can be mixed together what exactly is this water for injection meant for and what is a normal saline meant for so maybe if you go through that book you will get a lot of information about that and uh, so including iv fluids as i told you before most probably our concept is not to make the patient more hydrated and bring him back to the normal situation if that is how the situation they are not considered to be the palliative care or the end of life patients but somewhere we are talking more about the patients who are in the end of life and what do they really require most probably we don't go for the iv fluids even but sometimes we see that you know it's a family wish to have this when you talk about this point you may have to have a good conversation about the ethical principles what would be beneficial is the patient asking that is there a patient's autonomy beneficency justice and non maleficence non maleficence is are we going to administer poke the drugs uh, introduce the drugs again by poking iv cannula or whatever it is so hydration maybe at the end of life is not more helpful but if you feel that the patient is more dehydrated um fragile then you can go for that uh, meanwhile you, you should have a good conversation with the family that okay this is not going to be helpful so see today we have put on the fluids in this stage and there is no response for uh, for tomorrow if that is how the situation it is easy for you to convince the family that to prevent administering this kind of unwanted um, um, um fluids or whatever it is so even though to say the fluids also can be given in this route so to not worry about that there are few iv fluids um which can be given through that so two drug and three drug compatibility also has to be checked before administering if not they may form crystals or colloids in the in the syringes what you have loaded and uh, it is not so safe for the patient to so don't go for that at that time if there is no drug compatibility so symptoms that can be managed at this time like we have seen a patient who is conscious before on all of a sudden he became semi conscious and our home care team for example maybe after your training you may see lot of such patients there don't assume that everything will be all right one day so if the patient's condition is becoming worse day by day you may have to have a serious illness conversation with the family members telling that last 10 days there was lot of changes happening in the patient's body if that is how just a minute lot of disturbances from my side getting lot of messages there okay so if that is how the situation you may have to start talking about the serious illness conversation day by day the patient's condition is becoming worse at that point of time you may have to inform to the family that one day the patient may not be able to take all this oral medications how do we go further in that situation when you start conversation this kind of conversations before itself that will make some sense for the family members to think about that if you don't talk about that all of a sudden and you see a patient who is in a semi conscious state brought up to you or you going home up there there is no point of convincing the family at that time to put on a subcutaneous load it will not help them so to prevent that you may have to start talking about these are all the symptoms what can be managed if all of a sudden if you see any patient with uh, any of your I mean like your family member suffering up with pain you should not stop the medications and you may have to go for the other route then so we have another very good route like subcutaneous so we wanted to administer that if the things are changing tomorrow and if it happens tomorrow it's easy for you to go for go further for that so about this underneath this it's easy for us to manage the pain a very good pain management can be given just like an iv and more comfortable than iv through the subcutaneous route pain can be well managed nausea and vomiting 
so patients with intractable vomitings continuous vomitings so subcutaneous route is more safer uh, when compared to the iv uh, route confusion you can't go for the iv route at this time agitated confusion or whatever it is uh, you can't go for the iv route because in that confusion state patient uh, doesn't have a sense of um, feeling that okay i am put on iv cannula to control my symptoms they don't have that in their mind so what they do is they just pull it off and leave it like that maybe at that kind of situation subcutaneous would be probably the most better and uh, easily available and uh, to administer the medications and a lot of se respiratory secretions also maybe at this time patients who cannot take orally um, the symptom this kind of symptoms are been managed well in that route dyspnea lot of breathlessness assume that when you are breathless do you think your your airway passage or the oral passage will be more clear not at all you can't even take sips of fluids when you are more breathless if the same thing is happening with the patients that's better to stop the oral medications skip up to the uh, injectables at that time so i would like to share my experience in canada when i visited the hospital there lot of our patients who are with a lot of symptoms who are able to take oral medications one day they become worse they probably skip up to the other route like subcutaneous they explain to the family and the patient also telling them that this is a one of the safest route for you we wanted you to be comfortable we want all your symptoms to be under control assume that if one single patient is having all such problems which i have mentioned on the screen right now if they have all these problems for example to say one single problem what we experience out of this is itself a horrible thing when the patients really have all these kind of problems that is more tragic to say so at this time we can tell the family that okay this is what is happening we wanted your symptoms to be under control this type of conversation was brought from day one of admission tomorrow if something goes wrong we may have to yeah okay so when you start talking about that the symptoms are very well managed where instead of oral route they go up to the iv route try to control all the symptoms to a to a mark and then they skip up to the oral medications even uh, so the nurses plays a major role i have seen there you know a lot of nurses do not ever depend on the doctors or their information but still all the nurses are more trained in palliative care and they take a lead and they discuss with the doctor telling them that okay this patient's pain is not under control i feel that this patient should be put on the injectables go for the iv i don't think it is more safer that's better to have the patient be on subcutaneous route you know lot of tragic stories we heard more about uh, most of our children even i work with the children uh, hospice here in hyderabad uh, and also the neonatal palliative care most of the time kids are more worried about putting an iv cannula when you talk about that they just cry they don't they are not even worried about their physical pain some when you talk about uh, the injectables they are more scared of that so that will be there in their mind to prevent that uh, we may have to talk more about that our main goal is to control that symptom particularly it may take a 12 hours time or the 24 hours time so assume that the patient had severe pain at night they skip up to the injectables which is the subcutaneous route they put him on injective injection morphine for a time being till tomorrow morning so the next morning there will be a uh, team meeting they call it as a pulse meeting they all come together and discuss about what really happened at night so in the morning the whole conversation the night duty nurse and the morning duty nurse as well as a doctor take a charge at that particular time and skip up to the oral morphine, morphine uh, or any other opioid drugs uh, in that situations so uh, better to have a good assessment first when you have a very good assessment the management will be more comfortable and also the monitoring will be monitoring and follow up also plays a major role in that so the symptoms which can be managed in palliative care through the subcutaneous route is the underlined uh, symptoms so which conditions do you prefer that so patients experiencing intractable vomitings this is a time where you have to prefer the other route which is nothing but the subcutaneous route of administering medications patient experiencing intractable vomitings they only have lot of uh, fluids coming out from uh, the belly so if that is how the situation is never go for the oral route assume that the patient is having vomitings you are administering oral medications again don't you think that the whole tablet will come out and the patient will suffer a lot in pain again this is because of no opioids Uh, entering into the bloodstream so intractable vomitings to manage all the other symptoms go for other route which is subcutaneous so we prefer subcutaneous at that time uncontrolled pain and could not tolerate oral medications this is a time where we don't really prefer oral medications again when there is an uncontrolled pain and could not take oral medications we go up to the subcutaneous route nor 
the patients who are in the semi comatose state the case what we are discussing right now is all about that so patient with the performance of 20% 20% performance which just means that patient's condition is becoming bad they they can't do their own work they are completely dependable and they can't take even the oral medications too self care is not possible and sometimes the patient may be plus or minus delirious or confused or irritable even so that is how the situation in performance of 20 to 30 means a lot and uh, uncontrolled breathlessness never ever go for oral medications at that time because it takes time when the patient is in more of breathlessness never ever try to go for the oral route because it may take time and also there will be a uh, swallowing difficulty for the patient and uh, when it takes time they are more anxious and worried they try, they, want, they may come back and ask you for another tablet to prevent that let him stay back on the subcutaneous route with subcutaneous administration of morphine midazolam whatever the benzodiazepines you have and the opioids you have you can go for that and uh, once it is under control you can come up back to the normal oral route of administering medications and also in such cases like subcutaneous intestinal obstructions it's nothing but the fecus coming out as a vomiting stool coming out from the mouth we have seen a lot of such patients with intestinal obstructions and the stool they are not able to pass through the rectum and the stool has been collected for more than 15 to 20 days because there is no passage and the patient condition is bad where they couldn't even go for the colostomy at that point of time so i am not sure that we can control the vomitings or the fecal vomitings at that particular point of time but somewhere we can at least try to um, control that particular symptom might not be completely but at least to the partial limit of it so talk about the advantages of uh, administering subcutaneous medications and subcutaneous port so increased comfort for the patient when compared to the iv or the intramuscular route because there is less need of repeated injections administering to the so only thing is you have to put a syringe drive leave it just like that so the drugs will be continuously going into the body blood stream so control the control of multiple symptoms with the delivery of delivery of drugs in a sequential or combination form you can give administer morphine just like that followed by the midazolam followed by the haloperidol that's up to you when you have a lot of time and uh, the availability of nurses is more convenient for you you can go for that nor you can go for the combination of drugs look into the compatibility and go for that so the compatible drugs can be loaded in the same syringe and syringe and uh, fixed and leave it open like that so the drug can be entered into the blood stream in a given time independence and mobility also been maintained when you have a subcutaneous route it just means that patient should not be there on the bed all the time they can go out to the washroom they can go out and sit for a while they can do their own works or their activities even. so it is more convenient less frequent change of needle site comparing again to the intravenous route i'm sure that you may have to change it at least every 3 to 4 days not the 5 days but this route is more comfortable and it lasts long for a long time when compared to the iv intra intravenous route so less frequent changing of the needle site so these are the better advantages of this and benefits associated with the pain management coming back to the same point again can be used for in a patients with a poor venous access i need to stop up here because a lot of our patients we see are from the regional oncology center the government hospital here in hyderabad a lot of patients come back after the chemotherapy they come with all the veins blocked a lot of extra vasations you know a lot of injuries and a lot of pain even in that to prevent that it is more comfortable it can be used in patients with a poor venous access even at, you know getting the iv cannula is easy for maybe any one of us but for patients who are undergoing chemotherapy very fragile emaciated can't expect for a very good iv access even to do that so don't go for that at least the safer route is the subcutaneous route so provides pain relief for patients who are unable to tolerate oral medications the one who are unable to tolerate oral medication oral pain medications so this route is more beneficial in controlling the pain allows patients greater mobility onset of action takes about 20 minutes so not like an iv it may which may act very fast like in 3 to 5 minutes given uh, period of time but somewhere it is a bit slower but never mind that even though it is slower because you have a long process you are not thinking about this patient for just one day you are looking into a broader view where uh, you may have to reach or make the patient comfortable 
in that point of time you may have to administer the medications in a given intervals so maybe i think the point was covered for you in the pain management so what are the principles of the pain what are the principles underlying in the pain management is follow the time when you administer medications in time it doesn't really make sense in uh, delaying the process so whoever it is the family or have also been taught up about uh, uh, administering medications in the subcutaneous way so the onset of action takes at least 20 minutes so be ready for that whenever the given time is there about the drug go administer and come back so that the patients will not experience lot of pain so the cost are almost half of those associated with iv infusions and compared to that it is more cheaper and easily available and the family also can learn things at that time here the point is things to watch for what do we when the patient is on iv route sorry subcutaneous route what are the things to be watched for number one use a small gauge winged butterfly needle with the short length like i showed you before in my slide which is a 26 gauge needle very easier so needle can be drawn back again only the rubber tubing can be um, placed under the subcutaneous side so it is not painful and there because there is no needle into that and uh, as there is no needle it might not injure that particular side so it is more safer and easier so site selection depends on the patient's activity level and type of medications delivered if you feel that there are a lot of medications of iv sorry um like iv fluids uh, fluids also has to be given go for the site where the lumbar site you have lot of uh, you know thick layers over there so that will be more helpful so instead going out for uh, the upper chest or the deltoid region because you see lot of deposits the fluid get just collected out there and you see lot of swelling there so a wide sites where the tubing of the pump could be disturbed this mentioning that point here so site should be free from irritation away from the bony prominences and the waistline never ever put those in the joints or uh, irritated uh, irritative places of the patient if the patient feels more uncomfortable don't ever go for that site so report complications look for the leakage every day every shift all of our nurses will go out for to look into the subcutaneous route how the site is is there any leakage during administering of medications is there is there any redness surrounding the subcutaneous port or the patient is experiencing lot of discomfort over the insertion site these are the few things what the nurses keep watching into continued on subcutaneous hydration watch for the localized swelling and minimize the flu how do we regulate that the patient is in a semi comative state and the patient was put on normal saline 500 ml to run for more than 18 to 24 hours assume that how to regulate that you have a regulating nozzle in between over the iv set only thing you have to keep it in mind is when you see lot of swelling over the site it just means that you have put it very fast only thing is you have to reduce the droplets so that the swelling will come down and if you see very less swelling there you can just uh encourage or increase the speed of uh, the fluid going into the body so that's how you have to regulate that so patient and family has to be explained about the route of administration because most of us who are who join in palliative care or you all came here to learn more about palliative care including we before coming up to the palliative care we didn't know about the subcutaneous route yet. so how can we expect that the family can know more about that not at all so it is important for you to draw a picture on that demonstrate well how it is going to be explain them well we try to show the videos of the uh, subcutaneous route of administering medication so that the patient and family will have a um, thought about okay this is going to help me then i can go for that because iv has more disadvantages when compared to the subcutaneous route so check the device and its battery power this is another point where you have to see when you put the devices uh over near by we have two kind of devices one is a power supply to devices which with which we can just fix it only on the bed side but on the other side we also have a mobile and th- this is what i have shown you the continuous subcutaneous syringe right so this is a very portable one this is very old to say i can say that it we 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 got this from the british uh, um hospice in england uh, where we have got it from before 10 years ago so till now there are out of five we have four working till now it is a very portable just like your mobile phone and you may just have to fix up the syringe above that and uh, it also gets a pouch even so that the patient can be fixed up with the body anyway 
uh, as a carrying with the carrying pouch and then it is connected directly to the subcutaneous port and the patient can move around if you feel that the patient need to go out to the washroom and they, they refuse to um, pass tool on the bed then you can't just support that so you may just go for this that will be more comfortable when compared to uh, the fixed power supplied infusion so check for the preparations when you load all the medications check for those preparations crystallizations in the syringe so if it is all clear we can go for that approximately iv fluids like 1500 ml that mean approximately 3 500 ml bottles of fluid like uh, normal saline 25% dextrose also can be given through that and um, ringer lactate 5% dextrose can be given through that but be cautious look at the first point subcutaneous hydration watch for the local swelling to minimize and minimize the flow of the drugs to regulate that equipment required for to fix the port is a clean gloves alcohol swabs antibacterial skin preparations small 26 gauge iv catheter medications in appropriate syringes or the container so one thing keep it in mind when you put a patient on the iv route or maybe for your understanding i'm talking about that when you put a patient on morphine injection or you giving a morphine trail to control the pain try to use one single syringe for that because it looks like it is in most of the military hospitals i heard more about that military hospital they follow the same protocol that so if five cc syringe if you drug, if you load any drugs into that uh, which just means that that is haloperidol or this is a morphine or this is so and so so they have that they things there in mind because um, to minimize the confusion of administering medications they do so so medication should be given in appropriate syringes so use 10 cc syringe that will be more comfortable because you have one to one numbering there so each ml or two ml can be administered just like that so let us fix up to the 10 cc or 5 cc whatever it is according to the um, easiest uh, way you have and uh, last point is medication administration record which plays a major role uh, for all the nurses who are administering the medications whenever you administer medications you may have to document it well with the time and the symptoms what the patient is experiencing a lot of times such kind of patients we have a different care plan see number one the care plan for the family members what is the role of the family up here in this situation do they have to administer the medications not at all as a nurses and the doctors we have people to administer that what is the role okay they just have to be there on the bedside and if the patient is more irritable do not leave the patient so this kind of non non medical managements are been given to the family how about the nurses then so repeated assessment of the pain and the symptoms what the patient is experiencing and looking into the site are the drugs been given in a proper way or sometimes we may confuse and give a double doses of medications which is not so comfortable and which is called as a crime even to say so to prevent that we should have a very good medication administration record and the documentation of that the points to remember at this time is use infusion pump uh, that what i have shown you before 12 hourly to assess the symptoms and uh, add drugs if required when you put a patient on 12 hourly doses which means that this 12 hours is nothing but an observation so look for the changes in that do you think in this 12 hours with the re- regular doses what we have been fixed into that did it really help them okay so some way the symptoms are better under control which means that you may have to continue with the same drugs again and again if the symptoms are not under control which means that you may have to increase your morphine you may have to increase your meth uh, midazolam or the haloperidol to make the patient more comfortable which means that the patient symptoms are not getting under control with the regular doses which have been given right now so 12 hourly you put on a syringe drip that makes a sense in increasing or decreasing sometimes a patient may be over sedated just because of this medications so do not waste the drugs that's the reason why we put it as a 12 hourly in this 12 hours you get a good information that is the patient conscious awake and symptom free or the patient becoming semi conscious or more drowsy you can get that information from this so nurses charting on symptom as uh, severity and assessment during the time you administer medications or put on the infusion pump the nurses will have a chart for example the patient is with a severe pain who is in a semi conscious state i i hope that uh, this point has been covered for you just to remind that i am telling you that this patient is not in a conscious state to answer to your question about your pain maybe you might have seen about uh, asking um, the pain assessment using a numerical rating scale severity assessment scale a one rupee coin as the same patient is in a very bad state and more irritable screaming in pain what do you look for that then so patient is not in a stage to respond to your commands at that particular point of time maybe i am not going to answer to that right now just think about it he is not in a state to answer to you and his facial expressions has changed maybe that point i am going to add 
to this. So other than facial expressions, what do we have to look for? The patient in semi-conscious state assessing pain at that particular point of time. So based on that, we have a chatting and the severity. Okay, when the patient's pain or breathlessness is more severe, my goal or the concept is to control that in the next given period of time. If those symptoms are not controlled after 12 hours, nor till tomorrow, after 24 hours, still the patient is more breathless, a lot of pain, irritable, moaning, screaming in pain, which means that your performance or your medications did not give the patient real comfort. If that is of the situation, take a step forward and stop all the medications and try to increase the drugs and add on some other drugs which can help the patient. So nurses chatting at this time under the subcutaneous route, we preferring subcutaneous route just because of specific reasons like could not take oral medications or the vomiting, or the patient is uh, highly constipated or severe pain, dysphagia, uh, you know, uh, respiratory secretions, whatever it is, or semi-conscious state. So that's a reason why we are coming up to this level in putting on the subcutaneous uh, port. So at that particular point of time, I feel that all the nurses have to have a care plan and charting of the symptoms. A goal is to reduce the severity of the symptoms and document it well. It gives you a lot of uh, information. And also tomorrow you can you yourself can tell the other team members that, okay, the patient was in a lot of pain and breathlessness and anxious. We have added all these drugs with the severe complaints of this pain. And it came down with the regular doses what we have given here which shows you a lot of information. So chatting and the documentation plays a major role in that. Like care plan preparations and the team discussions. So this is what we have done for this patient. Is there anything else to be done? When you start talking about uh, the patient's condition with your team, the nurses will have their own ideas, including the housekeeping team. A lot of our attenders or the patients may talk more about their personal issues with the housekeeping team. They just come here to clean the floor, they just uh, um, clean the patient's bedside areas and then go. But still, they also play a major role. So what we do is in our team discussions, we call everyone in there. So the, sometimes the, the uh, IAS, we call them as IAS, housekeeping team. They say that, okay, this is what the patient told me yesterday. He's more worried about this. So you can gather those points and try to treat them well. So each and every single person in your team is more important. Never ever just throw... The, sometimes I see that nurses are not being cared more uh, in the hospitals. Whatever the doctor is prescribed, they just go for that. But somewhere in the on most of the other countries, what I have visited before, um, nurses play a major role in palliative care. I have to say that because you know, when I mean, compared to the doctor, the nurses stay back with the patient, see their suffering, and uh, controlling those symptoms. So they have to, like, we all have to put our own ideas. Even many times when I go up to my hospital, when I see such patients. Uh, who are in the problematic situations, uh, I go directly and discuss with my team and tell them that I hope that this patient is not doing well. So how much can you score? When people ask me about uh, how much can you score in his level of comfort, I say that it is 8 by 10. Can we reduce that? Okay. We also have a board where all these things are being mentioned in that, which means it's a priority and you have to see that patient first and control that symptoms. Planning well gives you a lot of information and reduces your work. That is what I wanted to tell you. Discuss among your team so that no point will be missed out from your mind in prescribing the medications. So how about the patient and family education? That's what the question was before. So explain the drug action. Tell the family members what you're going to do and why are we going to do this? So till now he was on oral medications and skipping up to the injection morphine. Injections, they feel that, okay, one day the death happens. There are a lot of our uh, family members say that, okay, this team has given some drugs and my patient passed away. Just because of the drugs, he passed away. This kind of misinterpretations may happen many times. To prevent that, we also give a written format information about what exactly and how exactly the morphine works, midazolam and haloperidol, whatever it is. So the beneficiency. So when you give the, uh, a leaflet or uh, a small piece of paper to the family members, they'll start thinking about, okay, this is going to be helpful. Yeah. And number two, loading technique. So... The question is, like, patients themselves can also administer the medications. This is a one of a good advantage for that. When there is no family members available, sometimes we see that um, mother has to go out for the work. And son is a patient who resides at home. And sometimes his, pa his pain increases or the breathlessness increases. What is the point there? What do we have to do at that particular time? So they can self-administer the medication, loaded medications. Loading techniques. 
So family also has to be taught. It is not just the nurse who is in the hospital doing all these things at a time, but someday try to train the people who are around and the family members also, how to break the ampule, load the medications and administer it very slow. So this is why I'm telling you is sometimes there are a few patients or the family members coming forward telling that my father, we don't want my father to die in the hospital because his last wish was to die at home. He wants his last few days to live at home. If that is all the situation, we can't take all the hospital setup up to the home and do all these things. To prevent that, more education to the family and teaching them how to administer the medications at home uh, plays a major role. That is more beneficial and more comfortable as it is a last wish also has been fulfilled for the patients too. How much to take for administration? If they get confused, they may just administer the whole medications what you have loaded uh, for. Maybe it is for a day, they just administer for uh, one dose itself. To prevent that, label it well, write it in a piece of paper and share it well to the family members and uh, look for the written demonstration also. So when you explain them, I tell them that, ask them that, okay, can you just demonstrate it to me again? Okay. Once they're okay with that, because they don't keep their minds more stable. They wanted to go home. They more think about what is happening at home and how to manage things at home. At that time, you might tell everything to the family, but they don't listen to you. So this is what you may have to keep it in mind. So ensure that, ensure the drug being delivered are safe to use. This is what we have to tell to the family members and careful inspection of the site every day for any signs of inflammation. This is what it's meant all about. So I'm up with my slides. I'm going to share a small video. It may just take a, a minute of your time. Uh, please cooperate with that. Okay, so coming back to that. Actually to say, there are no health professionals out there. So the subcutaneous administration of medications were given not by a real health professional. She's a volunteer from our side who just uh, finished her uh, uh, auxiliary nursing and she just joined us. So she stays or she resides next to this, this patient's house and she came forward. Uh, so we taught her a brief about how to administer that before. All of a sudden the patient uh, is unable to take oral medications. And all, the, all of that time uh, we requested her. She is very close to that uh, family member's house. So neighboring house. So she just came in and uh, helped that patient in uh, fixing that um, subcutaneous port. So this kind of local resources also has to be used at this point of time. Yeah, okay, I'm up with this. Please go ahead. Any questions? Um... Do we take questions now or uh, shall we uh, go for the case presentation and then at the end of the session, we'll talk more about this. Shall we go for the case presentation then? Or you can leave your comments or uh, questions in the chat even. At least we can read it out and answer to you in the public.
I don't see anybody answering anything to this. See, at least yes or no then. Okay, shall we go for the case presentation, please? Am I audible? I hope I am. So who is uh, uh, going to present the case now? Can somebody talk? Hello. So, uh, Pallim India, tip check out. Please respond to me. Uh, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'm audible. So, I uh, see sir, everyone so, is so silent there. Some, so, uh, so due to some technical issues. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's sir, uh, we can go for the case presentation. Before that, sir, actually, there is one question from Lovely, ma'am. That okay. is, drugs to be avoided other than the powered injection. Yeah, I didn't get that. Can you just repeat that question, please? Uh, Lovely, ma'am? Uh, Lovely, ma'am? Yeah, it is like, uh, uh, sir has already uh, told, actually, the drugs to be avoided to be in the, the injection form. Any other drugs we normally avoid? Like, I heard just wanted to like uh, normally we in subcutaneous like oh uh, yeah okay so uh, that, that's what i wanted to just confirm you know, because uh, there are few drugs uh, uh, which are not compatible uh, should not be given like um, diazepam is not so comfortable through that but uh, somewhere paracetamol it is an oily preparation you know those are more painful that's what i'm more worried about so like paracetamol can be given through the subcutaneous route but more very slow and uh, I know it gives you a lot of pain when you administer that medication. All oily preparation medications to be safe and secured during the time of administration. And um, um, drugs like uh, propofol, ketamine also can be given through that route. And uh, what else? Most of the drugs in palliative care can go for that. Thing. Any other questions or somebody can leave a message in the chat? Any questions? Otherwise, we can directly go to the case presentation. Any questions? Any doubts? Sir, can we move to the case presentation? Yeah, yes, please. Yes, yes, okay. please go ahead. Uh, sir, actually today, uh, Sister Preeti is the case presenter. Actually, she is busy with her duties. Actually, she is in a uh, meeting, but she is told that she is alone. She is doing the duty in the bar. That's why. So I am going to present this case. Okay, about the patient details. That is a 74-year-old male patient diagnosed with a cancer prostate with a skeletal metastasis. And presenting complaints are dull pain, lower pelvic area, dribbling of urine, difficulty of starting of urination, hematuria, excessive urination at night. And history of illness. A 74-year-old man presented with the complaints of dribbling of urine, hematuria, fever, loss of appetite, and hypertension. He went to local hospital, admitted there, protein investigations and biopsy done there, and diagnosed as cancer of prostate. During examination, the temperature is 101.4 degree Fahrenheit and the blood pressure is 190 uh, by 110 mm of Hg and pulse rate is 108 beat per minute and saturation is 95% in room air and respiration rate is 24 breath per minute and pain is 7 by 10 in an hour scale. And treatment and significant investigation, blood and urine investigation such as S SPSA, RFT, urine, URE, etc. done and MRI, bone scan, PET, PSMA done and diagnosed as cancer of prostate. He is on palliative chemotherapy with injection. 
leaded one eleven point two five mg subcutaneously once in a three months. Once in three months. And psychosocial aspects. Patient is seventy four year old man with his wife aged sixty two years. She has two daughters aged forty years and thirty five years. Both are married and living with their family. Presently, patient living with his wife in his own house, but they don't have any income. Some charity institutions helping them for his treatment. Patient wants to know about his condition, treatment modalities, and cost of treatment. Patient worried about his treatment expenditure. And the medications are capsule Lurimax for MG uh, one per day and tablet cal Caldi that is one. Uh, one per day and tablet atraxel three times per day. Tablet Pando forty mg one one per B, uh, bf and tablet Ceramelex two hours SOS and injection Lu Luoprolide eleven point two mg subcutaneous once in May, three months. Main concern about that is that they are dull pain in pelvic bone area, urinary retention, prognosis of diam. Prognosis of disease, side effect of treatment, financial condition, family and social issues. And summary: A 74-year-old man living with his wife diagnosed with cancer of prostate with skeletal metastasis. He is on palliative chemotherapy with the injection, Lurepralide 11.25 mg subcutaneously once in a three month. At present, he is suffering with back pain, urinary retention, and dribbling. So he is on CBD, fever, loss of weight. Uh, the main discussion points are, how can I protect my patient from infection? And how can I improve my patient's health? Then how can I explain his poor prognosis to him and family members? How can I help my patient's financial condition? How can I help my patient to reduce his back pain? Okay, thank you. Uh, Surup, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So maybe at this point of time, I would like to hear from the participants. So based on the case study, what you have seen, so how can we protect... Uh, the patient from the infections. Can somebody answer, please? We are up with the topic presentation now. We are uh, we have reached to the level of uh, you know discussing now. So I would like to hear from our side. Anybody, please I'll leave your message in the comment box. Sir. I would like somebody to speak at least. Yeah, okay. Can you just go back to the uh, slides? Can you come back? Yeah. Yeah, you can stop up here. Mm. Next, um, previous slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Next one. Mm. So maybe here I would like to stop and um, talk about the infections itself here, only about the infection. He went to the local hospital, admitted there, routine investigations done, biopsy done, then he was diagnosed as a CA prostate. Prostate, most common, urinary retention or dribbling of urine, these are most common. And also when you talk about uh, the skeletal metastasis, is a major problem where the patients may become bed bound. They may develop bed sore. I'm talking about only the palliative care side. I'm sure that the patient was more infected because of uh, you know fever, frequent fever and uh, hypertension. These are the things which can lead to uh, bedridden. Our idea is not to control his symptoms in the regular manner, but somewhere 
in the palliative care side when you talk more about that controlling the infections is um, is all about what we can do prevention of the bed sores and um, the, the routines has to also has to be changed if that is so we can go for the high high antibiotics also but somewhere but it is which is apart from the palliative care we don't uh, we do that but uh, only the situations where um, i i see that this patient's condition has been getting deteriorated day by day do you think this patient can get readmitted again in the hospital and uh, try to control the infections again it might not happen just remember one thing still if we are still in the general medicine it it would not be so worthy for you so talk more about think more about the palliative medicine at this point of time okay he is infected now what are we going to do do you think the cure can happen what would be your surprise question um, i don't know the whoever the presenter is here because uh, uh, the person who is presenting this case or um, you know uh, typed all the information up here would have seen this patient many times because she collected the information from the patient so maybe at this point of time she might know that okay how long this patient is going to survive if that is how the situation is if the condition is very bad and the patient is getting deteriorated day by day i am not going more in detail about the infections at all controlling the infection because my goal of care should be somewhere in controlling the symptoms controlling the problems explaining the family that this is what is happening tomorrow is going to be worse than today this is what we wanted to tell meanwhile what kind of suffering the patient is going through and the patient is on oral medications one day this patient has to be converted into the subcutaneous route yeah the patient said this time may I ask you more about when you start talking about your health improve the health and again there is a question where how would i discuss about the poor prognosis to the family so improving health is something different general medicine when you talk about but this patient is experiencing uh, having a is diagnosed with the cancer of prostate which also have a metastasis to the, uh, the skeletal metastasis so at this point of time uh, i don't know how the performance is going to be it looks like very uh, very poor it would be somewhere 30 or 40 which means that this patients may reach to 20 or 10 very soon just because of the infections you know many patients die just because of that but your your goal of action should not be in palliative care you know in palliative care it should be completely different from that okay he is having lot of fever he is infected yeah and also with the hypertension this underlying symptoms underlying causes itself can leads to death our more motto main motto should be talking more about the death and dying your patient is going to die one day this situation may change may change or may become more worst tomorrow if that is how the situation see all of a sudden when you talk more about the general medicine like uh, controlling the fever improving the health which may not happen with the patient with the ca prostate and um, skeletal metastasis this patient may develop bed sores as soon as possible because of the urinary uh, hesitancy or urinary uh, leakage dribbling of urine hematuria this multiple problems itself can lead to death and also he is uh, with hypertensive too so never go for that maybe try to bring the patient into the reality instead you bringing up to the reality we should not step back to them so you try to ask the family members about what are your expectations they may say that put the patient on icu put the patient in the ventilator there are other plans for us such plans but how good are we doing the justice to the patient at this time putting on the iv fluids putting on the ventilator it is so so easy for such kind of patients putting on high antibiotics you know how expensive it is when you talk about that try to use the local resources we are sure that even after maybe i felt that this patient is getting uh, chemotherapy but not sure how good this changes may happen in that patient so talking more about that bring this aspect into the palliative care and talk about it which gives you a lot of um, you know interest in caring the patient try to control the pain try to manage the urinary problems and prevention of bed sore explaining the family when you start talking about this the the family members can start listening to you maybe not today not tomorrow the day after so it may take time for them because this is a bad news what you are talking about so talk more about the serious illness conversation like i told you before start talking uh, telling them that how was the condition 10 days or 15 days ago okay he became bad earlier at least he used to do his own works but he is completely depend on on others if that is how the situation tell the family that it may become worst i'm sure that it may happen 
what where did those wishes gone where did the worries of the patient gone so frankly to say there are people who are there to talk more about the routine investigations blood tests you know evaluations and putting on the iv fluids putting on the injectables high antibiotics putting on the ventilator icu lot of hospitals have that but why do you think the patient in the end of life is suffering or not when you start thinking about that then you'll get lot of information about what are the right things to be done for him right now did the patient ask for uh, the further investigations or do the patient really want to know what is happening to him talk more about that because when you talk more about the situations happening around him he may give you a lot of different aspects of his mind i know that i am going to die one day but i wanted to be at home if that is his wish try to fulfill that wish when you are looking into the fever controlling the fever or improving the appetite controlling the hypertension controlling hematuria the patient may die in front of you one day if that really happens where is the point of you talking about the serious illness conversation breaking bad news breaking all these collusions talking more about that is more important than controlling the fever at fever or uh, uh, you know infections at this particular point of time it is just to remind you that where to stop and where to step ahead yeah uh, can you go for the next question please or any any uh, suggestions please go ahead for that so improving the patient's health maybe th this would be the family's point of view when you ask the family that what are your expectations the family may say that okay my patient need to have a good health so to improve the good health infection has to get under control point number 1 number 2 suffering should come down number 2 do you think the prognosis is good because in the next question there is a point where poor prognosis explanation to the patient and family because these two are not so relevant these two are different uh, aspects when you talk about health improvements and you are talking more about the poor prognosis it doesn't match up to that so better skip up skip the uh, second question would be more comfortable you can't improve the patient's health talk about more quality how do i improve the patient's quality care dignity during the death tell that that would be a uh, appropriate question maybe at this time so i'm skipping that question right now so how can i explain his poor prognosis to him or the family members as i told you before this is called as a serious illness conversation so this conversation has to be done at least a few months before his condition becoming worst because during the time of worst situation you can't talk like that uh, but somewhere try to talk to the family first and ask them so how my question should be how does this case reflect to me when i if i see this case i i have a feeling that how did this case reflect to me i put this case into the just like a mirror in front of me or what are the learning points for me what are the bad things i have done what are the improvements i would need what is good thing i have done when you talk about that what are the current family needs will be assessed at this time what do the family think they want him to be hydrated they want him to be put on a rice tube they want to be him to be fed well to bring back the energy okay these are the things what listed out by the family members go directly talk to the patient ask him about what are your current needs i can understand your condition you are suffering a lot what are your expectations like what are your wishes right now and what are you worried more about when you start talking about that it is called as a breaking bad news when you ask this questions me may come out and telling that okay i wanted to be with my children at my last moment of time i know that i am going to die if that is how the situation continue that come back to the family tell them that okay the patient himself said that okay he refused iv fluids he doesn't want the rice tube to be put on his nostrils and which is more irritable for him so it's called as the patient's autonomy don't we don't generally talk about uh, uh, the patient's choice or the family choice many times our medical professionals go in a way that okay it is all my choice to uh, go forward so never ever go for that patients who are in that kind of situations with the skeletal meds and uh, frankly to say the whole body is been damaged affected a lot and there is nothing to do for us there are some limitations for every one of us every health professionals so be in that borders and think about it and they'll get lot of information in the existing time so none of our nurses none of the doctors can spend 24 hours time in taking care of this patient right one single doctor or one single nurse can't do that so if that is how the situation that is how, those are the our borders which we marked in can go beyond that level so you can't cure them and heal them and get him back bring up to the reality tell the family that okay this is what the patient is expecting this is what we can do uh, i know that how uh, bad your condition is like uh, uh, you are suffering you you are uh, you are suffering you are going through but still we are there to help you we are there to support you 
support in the sense it is not just about the medicines and administering but they just need some health professionals to be with them uh, in explaining them about the situations and what are the medications we are giving changing of routes and uh, you know putting in putting a foley catheter managing constipation managing vomitings end of life or uh, the patients becoming worse they make it aspirated and dies all of a sudden where did this infections go on them all of a sudden it may happen for the patients who are completely on the bed yeah so the conversation it's a big process to say you may have to provoke and say that uh, do not ever pretend or, you know that, that should be a, a subjective information about uh, uh, what you are talking be planned tell them a brief information pause wait for their response or the reaction and then go forward it's not something like you clearly explaining the whole pattern in the same day and tomorrow you just leave it at uh, after explaining the whole information to the uh, patient uh, he may lose uh, he may loses his hope everything completely he start shouting at the family that you did not care me that's the reason why i'm here on the bed all the time i may die one day this death would be just because of you it's a lot of blamings may happen among the family members or the patient itself a lot of conflicts may arise and tomorrow you can't go there and sit and talk to them again to prevent that you should be prepared more and what questions you are are you going to ask look at the patient's uh, condition and the family are they really interested in knowing more about that draw some pictures and show them they don't know what prostate is they don't know what the skeletal metastasis is all about so try to bring up to the reality use a paper draw some pictures about what prostate is what is this organ is all about and uh, what is this skeleton is all about so tell them in the way that they can really understand and come back to your own thoughts and tell them that okay what can we do at this time so a lot of communication among the family members bring a big change instead you talking more about uh, this thing so you try to listen more about that okay? that is what my answer if you have any questions or comments on that please go ahead maybe at later so how can i help this patient it's a financial condition there are a lot of um, community volunteers who come forward to help the patients in our in our place earlier we were uh, ours is a very small program where we have three to four one doctor two nurses and with, with a small limited uh, resources available but right now there were approximately 85 to 90 staff working with us different programs we cover whole hyderabad as well as i have been a faculty or a, a trainer for the nurses in palliative care you know uh, we we also deal with the government program there we, we train the nurses in palliative care and implementing palliative care units in their own places like each district have their own uh, palliative care units now so that's how we go forward so when you talk about that it would be very simple or small when you initiate it but slowly it grows well so we have a community exposure of palliative care here many of the people who are around us know more about that so hands on many come forward even the patient attenders you know they their family members would have passed away they come back tomorrow in helping them so a lot of groceries are been given a lot of financial support is been provided to them even not just about that also followed by if suddenly there is a death happening assume that the same patient passed away tomorrow the patient died tomorrow how do they cremate if they are financially very poor how do they cremate the body do you think in this pandemic situation it is more easier not at all even getting an ambulance is also very tough right now if that is how the situation it should not be all of a sudden you talking more about that you should have a plan so we call it as a death plan even we are that maybe it may not make sense for you right now because uh, maybe why do we talk more about the death than dying but it is more important for the family members when you talk about that uh, there is a question in the chat teach them regarding social security measures from the government for palliative care patients as senior citizen excellent thank you so much so there are a lot of government resources like we have arogya sri the health schemes also available here and uh, some kind of uh, funding is also been provided for them if there are such things like that we can uh, take help of the government also we provide such things like that and there are few hospitals um, some organizations of the trust hospitals also help us in such situations we 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 also uh, get all this blood tests and ultrasounds done for free of cost and also the doctor visits like neurologist or urologist whoever it is they come to us for free of cost they come and see them see those patients you know try to bring that change we cannot be helping the family members in a broader way but somewhere up to the mark we can help them yeah i hope uh, you got the information from that so how can i help my patient by uh, to reduce his back pain what do you think the back pain is all about the pain again pain is all just because of the multiple skeletal metastasis most of the uh, 
approximately I can say 80 to 90 percent of patients with the CA prostate may develop uh, metastasis. Skeletal metastasis is most common there. So which means that the patient may suffer a lot in pain. As it is mentioned before, 6 by 10 or whatever it is, um, maybe go up to opioids, strong opioids like morphine. We have a morphine available. So morphine is the best drug of choice in controlling that. Try to add also NSAIDs to this, like a ketrolac or the diclofenac, whatever it is. So it minimizes the inflammation and controls the pain for a period of time. Followed by NSAIDs will be stopped one day. You can just keep building up the opioids. Opioids, today the pain is a bit under control. Tomorrow you can increase it directly. It may just take two days for you to uh, observe for the response for the pain for morphine. So in next two days, you can just uh, go up. There is no roof level for controlling the pain in, of morphine because it, there is nowhere that, okay, this is the last limit for morphine. It is all individualized again. Look for the urinary uh, hesitancy and the constipation. The patients may also develop vomitings. After you administering morphine, they may develop that. To prevent this, these are the poor drug compliances to say. You know, many times the patients they have no information at all about morphine or tramadol. They go with the medicines and no information was shared with them. They go take medicines and they vomit. They go take medicines and they become constipated. They stop taking medications tomorrow and they have a lot of pain and come back to you in the same situation. To prevent that, educate the family about how to administer the medications. What are the side effects? What are the toxic effects? You can see it as a delirium, uh, respiratory rate coming down, um, myclonic jerks, hallucinations will be developed at that time. So talk more about that. How frequently do they have to take morphine? Like for example, fourth hourly, or if we can go up to the fentanyl patch once the patient's symptoms are under stable uh, condition. So maintaining back pain is all about controlling the pain. Uh, it is also a kind of, uh, it would be a neuropathic pain even. Uh, neuropathic circumstances also can be seen at this time. So try to increase the medicines. Can, I, can we go for the medication slide, please? Yeah. So something I would like to correct up here. Never ever try to add some Urimax or, you know, these are all called as a brand names. Never do that. So try to put something which is relevant. Ultraset, try to put a combination there. So the patient is experiencing a lot of pain and you know that CA prostate itself can be more painful, number one. And on the other side, the patient also developed skeletal metastasis. Assume that this patient would be in a severe pain. So I don't think because this paracetamol ultraset is a combination of a paracetamol, uh, 350 mg with the combination of 32 mg of uh, tramadol, I feel. Mm, so it's not a bit, big deal for you to control his symptoms. So if you are already tried with ultraset and there is no good pain relief, better to skip up to the morphine, uh, which is somewhere more potent than morphine, uh, than uh, tramadol. So one is to five ratio, five times stronger than this. So you can go for the 10 mg of oral morphine or Try to increase it based on on your observation and monitoring. You'll come to know what is exactly happening. Try to add some NSAIDs so that the patient's pain will be literally under control for in next two to three days. And also observe for monitor for the over drowsiness and all. Yeah, I'm up with this. Any other questions? Sir? Yeah, can we can we wind up? We're out to have to go and see the patients again. <laughs> if you don't have any questions, I can leave. Uh, Parson, have any questions? I don't think so. So since the time we started the session, <laughs> everyone is just silent. Yeah, actually, it's a silent. Yeah, right. Actually, only yeah. one chat is there. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. That's okay then. Can I leave? I have to go see my patients. Oh, yes, sir, sir. Thank you so much. Thank okay, you. anyway, thank you, sir. Thank you for thank this. You. Yeah. Thank you so wonderful much. presentation, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank see you. you next week. I will share the, uh, our feedback link on our WhatsApp group. Okay, we are, yeah. so we are going to wind up the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.